Welcome. How are you today? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, did you enjoy the episode? Isn't it? It's just so beautiful and sad and just really, it's a lot to process. <laughs> Um, I am Stacey Wilson-Hunt. I'm the Hollywood editor here in LA for New York Magazine and Vulture, and a frequent moderator here. You may have seen me before. So I will waste no time in bringing to the stage Jennifer Jason Lee. Jennifer, come on up. Thank you. Hi, welcome. It's so nice to have you here. Thank you. Uh, and there are a lot of fans of yours in the room, which is always nice. So before we get to Patrick Melrose, um, it, it's in revisiting your career and prepping for today, it's you have done so much work <laughs> in so many genres, in television and film and theater. At this point in your career, when you look back at all of your accomplishments, how do you feel? Do you still see yourself as a journeyman actor? Do you, do you see yourself as someone who has to audition? Or do you find yourself now at the point where okay, I can sit back and be very selective. How do you feel right now? Um, I kind of feel like all of those things a little bit. I, I don't really have to audition anymore, which is kind of nice, but I also really enjoy auditioning. And I'm not great at small talk, so <laughs> it's kind of easier for me to do what I can do. Um, but Which is act really well. That's what you can do. You. Yeah, I feel like that I can do. Not always, but in certain things. And um, yeah, and I feel like I uh, I can take more time now in a certain way and really pick things that I am attracted to and love. Or, you know, take the big peach paycheck. So whatever, whichever comes first. <laughs> or sometimes at the same time. Yeah. You know, sometimes yeah, it, so, yeah. it works out that way. You don't have to make the decision between the artsy small paycheck and then the bigger project. You can do both. Hopefully, Hopefully. yes. That's the dream. Um, and you grew up in a showbiz family. How did those early experiences and exposure to what your mother and father did in their jobs as actors and writers, how did that impact your wanting to also join the business? Well, as a child growing up in Hollywood, it just seemed like that's what people did for a living when they grew up. I mean, it did not seem like some faraway dream. It just seemed like, oh, yeah, you grow up and then you make movies or TV or you write that or you direct them. Or So it, I think the naivete surrounding that made it kind of easy for me. And um, it was, yeah, it's kind of... In a way, I never realized how lucky I was um, because it just seemed normal. Um, and I think that that was fortunate for me. And when did you realize that not all people in the world become actors and writers and producers? Did you have you know, a friend at school saying, oh, I want to be a fireman or, <laughs> or a doctor? And you realize, oh, we have options. No, I, no, I realized it. I mean, obviously, I knew there were other jobs. <laughs> but um, you know, it's like a, an industry town. You know? It's like we grew up, the industry was the railroad. Everyone would work on the railroad. But um, I realized it, I think, when I had friends that I thought were enormously talented that had a hard time getting work. And then I realized how lucky I was. Yeah, and that it didn't, it wasn't just necessarily going to happen just because you grew up here or you thought it would or because your parents were involved uh, in the industry. Um, and I was like very, you know, when I was a kid, I also, I didn't take my father's, my father was an actor, and I didn't take his name because I also didn't want to get credit for being his daughter. I wanted to sort of make it on my own, that kind of idea, um, which is also somewhat, you know, naive or whatever, but it was important to me. And what was the performance that you did either when you were a kid or, or as a teenager, and this could be in school, it could be anywhere where you felt confident that you could actually pursue this, where you got feedback that was meaningful, or it was a part that really resonated with you that you thought like, oh wow, I really, I think I can actually pursue this full time. I always, I just always felt very, very comfortable acting, even at school. I mean, as young as like preschool, you know, we were doing plays and, <laughs> you know, even though it's pretend and make believe and there's no audience. <laughs> really that's sort of what you do and I, I I always knew I wanted to act so I always felt I was always incredibly confident in that way 
but it didn't feel like confident. It's, it just felt like something I enjoyed doing and that I loved doing. Um, yeah, and my mother was very strict about the idea that I not take any kind of formal acting training um, until I was older because she, she felt, and I think rightly, that children are just so instinctive and they are natural and you don't want to start curbing that or shaping that in any way. You want it to just be an expression of who they are and a joy. So, and she also wouldn't let me act professionally either, no. Um, even though I wanted to. Um, well, she relented at some point. Yeah, <laughs> at some point. And you did end up working with Lee Strasberg and when you were I, I went to the Lee Strasberg Institute okay. um, for a summer program. So it's not as like, you know, fancy as it, <laughs> as it reads. Um, it does sound fancy. <laughs> but uh, I did walk there because it was like on Hollywood Boulevard so I could walk, <laughs> um, which I probably wouldn't do today. But, <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, you could easily Uber now. And what did you learn there that summer that has stuck with you over the years? They did a lot of sense memory stuff, you know, like the, the kinds of things you see in, in movies that make you laugh, like <laughs> you're holding a cup of coffee, smell the coffee, feel how warm the cup is, how does it make you feel, you know, like all that stuff. So we did a lot of that, and like being at the beach and things like that. But the funny thing is, like, I still use it today, so, you know. It was, it's silly stuff in a certain way, but in another way, it just relaxes you and it grounds you. That's very cool. And you said you enjoyed auditioning and have enjoyed auditioning. Do you have something that you do when you walk into the room that puts you in that state of mind that gives you the confidence to feel like whatever happens, you've done your best? Do you have like something ceremonial or anything that you do to prep for those moments? I had um, a great acting teacher once named John Lynn, and he said, something that always stayed with me, and I always tell friends this that are auditioning. Um, and he, what he said was, when you audition for that five minutes or 10 minutes that you're in the room, you have the part. It's yours. So you may never have it again. <laughs> <laughs> but for those 10 minutes, you own it. And enjoy it. And that was great advice because instead of being nervous or wondering how you were going to play it, you just inhabit it in a way because it is your chance to actually be that role. Um, so I, I, yeah, that. I I'm good so. life advice in general too. Mm -hmm. Like for any important moment you walk in and act as if you've already accomplished what you wanted to accomplish, which I think is great. Yeah, I mean it just, yeah, I think for acting especially it's just helpful because people can get so nervous and especially now I really, I feel for people with all the self-taping and, you know, where people come in and they are put on tape right away. I, I don't, like when I was starting out, there was, they didn't do that. And I think that's very awkward to feel like suddenly like you're on camera and there's just this added pressure and it's, never, you know, those tapes are never lit well and it's just... And it looks like you're in an office, but you're playing a scene that's, you know, it just looks weird. Like the whole thing is just off. So, um, yeah, I remember when that started happening, when people started taping auditions, I remember just saying, can we not? I remember asking if we cannot tape, but I don't even think actors have that option anymore. I think just everyone's sort of put on tape. Right. Or they tape themselves on or their phone. Or they tape them, <laughs> yeah, themselves on their phone, yeah. Which can work and not work. You've, you've had so many incredible, what I would call breakthrough performances. Is there something that you consider your big break? Because you obviously did a lot of work and you did work in television and then did work in features. But is there a role where you thought, okay, I'm being taken seriously now. When I walk into a room, people know who I am. I'm my own person. Is there a part that you look back on now and think, oh, that was the part that got me that recognition? Um, yes, I um did a movie called Last Exit to Brooklyn, and oh, yeah, <laughs> very good. Yes, and Miami Blues, and they both came out within a few months of each other, um, and that really changed my life um, because I, for some reason, I just got a lot of recognition for them, and I got some awards, and so yeah, it was a it was a real break for me. And how did you find your career changed after those parts? Did it, did it open up or did you find yourself kind of being seen as that type of woman? Um, no, because although they were both prostitutes, they were <laughs> funny, um, they were very timing. different women. 
So, um, yeah, I just suddenly was being offered things and, you know, just everything changed. Like a lot of doors opened and things got a lot easier for me. I was reading at some point, it was either a journalist or a critic referred to as the Meryl Streep of bimbos, which I, I think is meant to be a compliment, but I actually kind of find it <laughs> not a compliment at all. I, I take it as a compliment. You do? Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, if you could say my name with Meryl Streep's name in any sentence, I'll be very happy. Good. I just wanted to make sure that you felt okay with it because I felt a little like, ooh, that's not very nice. Um, have, you, have you played a character whom you feel is closest to who you are or someone you have related to the most? Or is, is every part you play a sharp departure from who you are? I mean, a lot of them are pretty far away from who I am and I'm attracted to them for that reason. Um, I did an animated, um, a stop motion animated film uh, for Charlie Kaufman called Anomalisa and I feel like that was Beautiful somewhat close movie. to me yeah. in a certain way. Which came out at the same time as Hateful Eight. Yes. <laughs> so yeah. it's quite a... Yes, yeah, so that was a lucky a, thing for a, me too. A spectrum yeah. of performances there. And on that front, um, the Hateful Eight recognition was obviously so deserved, your first Oscar nomination. So amazing. That movie is insane. <laughs> how, how did it feel going to work every day with those guys and Quentin? And how did it change the way you perceive filmmaking now? Because a lot of actors who've worked with him walk away with this renewed sense of like, wow, we can do that on film or that's the process? Because he really does operate in such a singular way. How did it change the way you make movies? I just... Um you can't imagine what it's like to work on one of his sets until you have the experience. It really is a game changer. Um, he makes every single day a celebration and everybody is giving 150% of what they can give. Like, and he recognizes everyone. Like, the, you know, the guy who's was doing the blood on set and he would literally like drink the blood and have to spit it to get the correct sort of um what am i trying the design on the floor of where the blood fell the only way he could do that and and he would say everybody we need to step back and let darren do his job and we really need to appreciate what he's doing because he's an artist and you know like he just there was always a moment where he he everyone on that crew is like a family member he knows everyone's name, he appreciates what everyone does, and he loves actors, and he just gives his all, and so you find yourself working harder than you've ever worked and enjoying it more than you ever have, you know? So it's really, I wanted all my friends to work with him. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's only making one more movie, or so he says. I don't believe anything he says about only making one more movie, come on. And, and did you walk away from that almost feeling like, gosh, I've been so spoiled, it's gonna be hard to, have that experience yes again. Yeah. absolutely that's the hard part of having an experience like and that. also never wanting it to end i mean we shot for a long time but we all wish we were still shooting it today <laughs> well there's always a sequel opportunity and you've also done a lot of great television work the last few years um i loved your arc on weeds um obviously your first showtime project and then revenge which let's not forget revenge because it's revenge um and then Atypical, which I was just catching up on last night. Have you guys watched Atypical Netflix? Such a beautiful, it's a sweet show. You're also a producer on that series. Why was that project important for you to do now in, at this stage in your career? Um, I just, I really liked what, I like what it's about. I like that it's dealing with something that so many people are dealing with in their lives and in a way that feels very gentle and real and it's funny also and sweet. Uh, there's a real sweetness to it. And yeah, I just, I, I, I find it very touching and funny. Have you heard from parents who have children like yes. the, the boy and depicted? What have they said to you about how it reflects their lives? They really appreciate, I mean, the people that I've met who have come up to me in like the oddest of places just really appreciate that a show is dealing with a subject matter in, in this way, you know? And, um, yeah, you, f you really, like parents have come up to me with tears in their eyes, you know, and the show is, is very funny in many ways and, and, you know, but um, yeah, it makes you feel like you're involved in something that is important to people and that's, that's a nice feeling. I don't know that I've really had that before. Well, not from Hateful Eight, you wouldn't get that same <laughs> <laughs> response. <laughs> and, and on the subject of fans, 
because you have played so many amazing parts, what do you find people say to you when they do recognize you now? Is it more hateful aid? Is it people geeking out about fast times? <laughs> is it, you know, is there, is there an in-between? Um, it's all, I mean, it's really, it's whatever people have seen and liked, you know? Like, there's a whole, like, contingent of Dolores Claiborne fans, and there's, like, the... Dark contingent of people. Yeah. <laughs> single life female. There's, it's just, like, all, I mean, it really depends. There are the fast times people, and then, of course, hateful aid and things like that. But, yeah, it just really depends. I don't, I don't, I don't have a, one thing that people always talk to me about. That's the, the benefit of having played a lot of parts. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you have a wide variety. And, and we, I can't not ask you about working with David Lynch on Twin Peaks, um, which was, I'm still recovering from that situation last year. <laughs> One of the strangest, most crazy things I've ever seen on television. How was working with him distinct from other experiences you've had in terms of director-actor relationships? Oh, he's just, he's really so, he's so sweet and positive and funny. And um, he's also very open. Like um, Tim Roth and I were playing a married couple and Tim was like, we should have, you should write another scene for me and Jen. And he was like, okay, I will. <laughs> <laughs> That's not typical. <laughs> yeah, no, that doesn't happen every day. So yeah, he's, he's lovely. Well, it's interesting because I think there's this perception of him as this, you know, this like crazy auteur who's so fixated on every single element of his production. So to hear that he's that flexible in the moment, I think is He very is open cool. and he also is very specific. Like he recognized that a stool was different in the back of a truck that we had shot three weeks prior. You know, and it was like, wow, I don't know how he is aware that that's a different stool. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have, like, I don't remember it. But, um, yeah. He has an incredible eye, to say the least. Incredible. So we come to Patrick Melrose, um, which is, I I haven't seen the finale yet, but I've seen the first four. And this series, I guess it's a show, but a miniseries, whatever we want to call it, has really affected me. Because we haven't seen this deep dive of of a look into how abuse can really affect someone's life, the trajectory of their life. What appealed to you about this story, but also playing Eleanor, who's, you know, we, I think we all have conflicted feelings about her um, as to what she didn't do and what she did do mm-hmm. when Patrick was a boy. What spoke to you about her specifically? Um, I just thought she was an incredibly rich, complicated woman. Um, and I had read the books, and the books are, if you haven't read them, I really recommend reading them. They're so beautifully written. And, and essentially one book translates to one episode. Is that true? I yes. Think. Okay. So, so there's five There's five, five novels. Uh, there are five shows. So, um, and you just watched this two, right? So that's actually the first book in the series. Um, so they changed it. Um, Interesting. I didn't realize that. The, f- the first episode is actually the second book, the second novel. So it opens with more of Patrick's younger life and seeing you. It starts and, with yeah. Nevermind, okay. yeah. Okay. Um, and then it goes into Bad News. Um, so anyway, the novels are incredibly brilliant, and I didn't. I really didn't think you could translate them into any kind of film or television adaptation at all, or play or whatever. And then um, and then I read the screenplay and I loved it. I mean, I thought they were great. Um, and I saw Edward Berger's movie, Jake, which I loved as well. And I was thrilled to be able to play Eleanor. I mean, she's such a, she's just such a rich character, you know, and she's such a complicated woman and she's in so much denial and she's, she's trying so hard to be a good person mm-hmm. and to she's be so a good too. mother and she's yeah she's not only wounded she's in this like incredibly abusive yeah. marriage um and she you know all the love she has she has for her son she has to give in secret mm. you know because the father is such a maniac he she can't display it in front of him or be affectionate to the boy in front of him mm front of the father and so you know as a viewer of course you want her to take action um, sooner than she's able to um, ultimately she does but not even in the way you would like and certainly not in the most helpful way for Patrick and yet she's also an innocent and she's also abused um, and so for me, I feel a little bit, 
um, like I have to defend her, but also whenever you play a part, you have to get inside their skin, and um, I, yeah, I really care for her. I mean, she's a she's obliterated on drugs and pills most of the time, but that's her only means of sort of surviving it. And she'd love to take Patrick and put him in her back pocket if she could and take right. him in that car with her and just drive, 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 but she can't. Right. Um, and also it was a different time. You know, if she, if she left with Patrick in 1967 and just took him, she could be arrested for kidnapping. It's a very different time. Women couldn't right. just leave their husbands and take their children. Right. I wonder what kind of reaction Hugo has gotten about his performance if he's, you know, because he's such a monster and maybe it's almost as if you are receiving more of that. Why didn't she do more? Whereas, you know what I'm saying? Like he's right. actually the, he's, he is the abuser and yet the female character is supposed to be the one who's the nurturer who's going to sweep, you know, And you in. want her to. Right. Right. You know, and and of course she should have, you know, we, but it's so easy to sit back and watch it and say that. But if you're actually, you know, playing her, then you have all these other things going on, you know, and um, they live where they live is so remote. Right. Um, and so they're in the south of France in this beautiful place that, of course, she paid for. He does absolutely nothing, <laughs> David. And um, it's a prison. Right. A be very beautiful prison. Yeah. yeah. But still. But it's, it's interesting, everything that's going on with Hollywood, but also globally, how we're trying to reckon with abusers and, and you know, why didn't that person do something? Why didn't this person? Mm -hmm. Stories like this, even though they're not about what we're dealing with in the industry, it really speaks to this is how intimidation and, yes. and strength yeah. and how someone can and lord. status quo. Absolutely. Can lord over someone and create this environment where the child. You feel like you have no choice. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think it, but it's humanizing. I think it's mm -hmm. very important. Uh, what is it work, uh, like working with Benedict? Mm -hmm. He's so brilliant. He is beyond <laughs> in this part. He's insane. He's really, I, I haven't mean, seen so someone good. throw themselves into a part like this in a long he's time. He's so brilliant, yeah. So he was incredible to work with. I mean, he's also very easygoing and very sweet, and there's none of that, like, weird star stuff that, <laughs> you know, sometimes you have yeah. with people. He's really genuine and very caring. And um, and he, apparently he just saved someone from being attacked. We were just talking about this earlier. He, last fall, apparently he jumped out of a cab and helped a de delivery person get safety from people who were beating them, him oh, up. Oh, wow. Yeah, that just came out yesterday. So. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, he's a real superhero. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and is there someone you haven't collaborated with yet at this point in your career, a director, a fellow actor, producer, writer, who if you could just devise a dream project to work on, uh, is there someone who is sort of like on your list? Oh God, there's so many. I mean, I'd love to work with Paul Thomas Anderson. I, I love his movies and I've known him for a really long time and never had that opportunity. So that's, that's someone I, I really admire and I'd love to, love to work with him at some point. And do you want to do more producing and be behind the scenes? Um, yeah. TV, film, anything interests you? Um, yeah, I mean, it really depends on the project and where it belongs, you know? Because every, every project sort of belongs somewhere and you just have to find the right one. Like Atypical is a perfect example that Netflix was the ideal home for that show. Yeah, right. and this is Showtime and that makes perfect sense. And, yeah. <laughs> right. And is there something that you like to watch in your downtime, uh, either a guilty pleasure or something that you've gotten into recently that you uh, have binged? Um, I just watched um, Better Things oh, and Stranger Things. <laughs> Better Stranger. I keep wanting a crossover of those two shows because it's just... just and The Looming there. Tower I just started watching. Um, yeah, so those, those are the three most current things that I... Those are good escapes. Did you watch Stranger Things with your son? I did. <laughs> There's always this big, I talk to a lot of parents who don't know whether to show Stranger Things to their kids. And I always wonder, you know, is it better if you watch it together? It's, it, it seems like such a show where kids are able to kind of find their inner viewer, you know, for the first time. And so it's, I think that's cool. Loved it. Loved it. But he wouldn't <laughs> want to watch that alone. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. It's, it's good here and there. And if you have a day when you're not working and don't have any responsibilities, what's your ideal day off? What do you like to do? Um, read, mm -hmm. hike, sleep, <laughs> eat. <laughs> simple, simple pleasures. Those are simple yet hard to carve out time for those yeah. in, in our busy lives. Well, great. Well, we have a few audience questions. Want to make sure we get to these. Let's 
see. This is from Anonymous, so this must be very hard hitting. Uh, <laughs> actually, it's not. Uh, this, it says, the film Undercover was the first time I noticed your tremendous broad range and talent. Well, was that a challenging role for you? And any insights about that role in particular that we may not know about? Um, undercover, yes, we shot in Louisiana. Here are my memories of Undercover. <laughs> <laughs> I remember jeans I wore that I drew on. I remember the hotel, motel, swimming pool where we all swam at night. Um, I think I got a ticket on the highway. <laughs> And I enjoyed it. I enjoyed shooting it. I, I liked the cast. It, you know, it was exciting to get a job. It was, you know, all that stuff. How old were you at this point? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I think John Stockwell directed it. Um, yeah, I had a really good time. That sounds like a good pastiche of memories. Uh, this is from Jesse. And Jesse loves the film. Uh, I love this movie as well. The Anniversary Party. Oh. That you wrote and directed so good uh, any Thanks chance that you will be directing please. again um, yes um, I hope so Alan and I are talking about doing something together again actually Ooh. so we'll see Ooh, I love that collaboration and is this Jazara am I pronouncing that correctly Jazara would like to know do you have a specific process with acting and I guess how do how you approach a role or is it dependent on the particular part um, both I do, I do a lot of research, and I also, um, I mean, it really does depend on the part in terms of the research and things like that, but I also always keep a journal for the character so that if I have a scene, I have that character's memories in the back of my head. So I'll write memories down that have nothing to do with the scene. I'll write memories down that actually do. So instead of like trying to memorize the dialogue, I'll try to create a backstory from like something that happened when I was five or something that happened last month or a dream I had last night. And that will really inform the scene in a strain in a way that you wouldn't necessarily think it would, but I find it really helpful. And is there something you do the minute you get a script for the first time? Do you read it through once and then go back and make notes or do you make notes along the way? Is there something I really hate you making notes. You do, okay. Yeah. I, say, mm. just, I don't know why. I just <laughs> <laughs> You'd rather just enjoy it. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I just like to read it and see if I enjoy it or I don't enjoy it. It's like when I watch a movie, I don't talk during the movie, you know, or write down my... I know I have friends who, like, write down their thoughts about the movie afterwards. I don't, I don't do any of that. Um, you just like to be a fan. I just like to have it. the experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to just be a fan. I just want to see the movie as an audience member. I, I just... I love going to movies. I And, you know, and now I like watching, like, really great TV and I just enjoy it. So I don't really want to, I don't want to really necessarily be a critic of it or try to figure it out. I just want to have the experience of watching it. And that's how I approach, my mom was a screenwriter. So I've been reading screenplays, I don't know, since I was nine. Um, and I read them the same way. I just want to read them and feel what I feel from it. Um, but I don't always finish a screenplay. I mean, if, I, if I'm really not liking it, I don't. <laughs> it's a hard sell if you're not liking it, just to yeah. get through it. And do you have a favorite movie of yours that you've made that if you... Oh, mine? If you're flipping channels and you come upon it, you actually sit and watch? <laughs> um, I, I, I have a lot of movies of mine that I really, really like and I'm really proud of. I don't know that I would say I have a favorite. I might stop and watch it for watch something for a few minutes. I don't know that I would, you know, watch the whole thing. <laughs> An extra spare hour, two hours, right? Yeah. And and I did want to ask you about the incredible um, aging makeup you have in Patrick Melrose in episode. We don't have that much. In on your character in episode four. We initially we cast my face, and you know we did a whole thing, and it took a really long time, and. It's creepy getting that stuff done. Yeah. You know, it's very claustrophobic. And How long did it take to get that done? To get the cast made? Mm. I think two hours. Mm. Um, but then it came, and it was like the day we were, uh, like I arrived and we were shooting, and the thing was like very, very thick and masky, and it looked like I was, <laughs> like a Grimm's fairy tale or something. It's like pretty scary. I was playing a witch. <laughs> no, and so we took it off. We didn't use it. Oh, you didn't? Wow. No. So we just used random pieces 
like prosthetics. But, yeah, but like very that. random and very few. We didn't have enough, actually. Wow. So it was just really acted. I mean, we just didn't have, and I just wanted to be able to act that part of the film. Right. It was very um, poignant to me and specific to me, and I, I didn't want to feel like I had a mask on, and then I wouldn't be able to accomplish what needed to be done. So less is more, I think, in a certain way. And um, yeah, I mean, obviously there's a wig, and there's some pieces on the eye and stuff, but there's very, very little. Well, it definitely doesn't look like you. <laughs> I yeah. mean, she's supposed to be in her 80s at that point, right? In 70s and have yes. had a stroke, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in playing the, the older version of Eleanor versus the younger, did you find yourself feeling that you were playing two different people? Or did you, was it sort of all the pain that she had experienced kind of culminating in that, in that older self? You know, and the older self is a lot of innocence, I think, to her because... Um, yeah, there's a very specific thing, I think, that happens when people are dying and getting older and in that way where they're sort of bedridden and that they become very childlike again. And also she's lost her ability to communicate. So like a child, it's just she needs people in a way that she hasn't, um, yet she can't communicate that need. So there were just a lot of, it was trying to be very, very specific with the, the language and even the way she held her hands and vocally what she was able to do and things like that. So I, I, yeah, I loved, I loved doing that part of the movie. It was very beautiful and overall thank just you. stunning performance. So thank you for coming today. Thank, thank you guys you. for being Thanks. here. Thanks so thank much. You.